Hello and welcome to the Aesthetic Insider. I'm your host, Angela Omaro. I'm here today with Dr. Richard Brown, a plastic surgeon who practices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and who firmly believes that plastic surgery should be the last resort. Dr. Brown, welcome to the Aesthetic Insider Show. It's such an honor and a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, um, absolutely. And before we get going, like I know we're going to talk about life balance, nutrition, exercise, surgery, and, and many other aspects of things that you, you know, firmly believe in, in, in your medical practice. But before we get going on that, I'd love for you just to tell our audience a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and uh, why we're here today. Absolutely. So I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. Uh, I grew up in Georgia, so I'm a Southerner. I, I ended up out here in Arizona after my plastic surgery training. So I, I trained in general surgery first, then plastic surgery. I've been out here for about 14 years in Scottsdale, Arizona, practicing. I'm in solo practice. It's just me. Uh, I do a lot. I used to do a lot of breast cancer reconstruction. That sort of tapered down over time as insurance has gotten a little difficult lately. But I do mostly breast and body work. Um, and again, that involves cosmetic and reconstructive work. And uh, yeah, I, and then I've just, as you alluded to, I've more recently in the past, probably five years or so, become a lot more in tune with fitness and wellness and how that might apply to my field and, and how I might be able to use that in my practice. You know, I find that like great and, and amazing because, you know, I've been in the aesthetic industry for quite some time. And and I think you know one of the, the the things I hear many times from from other doctors is there's no time for them, and it's so hard. You know, you, you they start surgery early, they run late with patients, their schedules always full and booked, and there's no time for them. You know, in terms of eating on time, working out if possible, and so you know how how what advice would you give to somebody who's like you know well, how do I I begin to, you know, create life balance for myself. And does it start in the practice or does it start at home? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. I'll, I'll tell you though, I am um, the whole balance thing. I have a very, a very different spin on balance. Unfortunately, I feel like you have to have incredible imbalance in your life. So you have to decide, is my imbalance going to be leaning towards making money, money, money? And that's all I want to do. And I just want to operate and see patients all the time and spend less time with my family or do I want my balance to be less of that and more of just time with my family and more me time? So I think that, you know, to get where I've gotten, I needed incredible imbalance, right? Like I had to be so focused in med school. That that's all I did. And I did not work out and take care of myself. But now that I'm in practice, it's just a priority to me. I, I am an exercise freak. I love doing other things to challenge myself. I started jujitsu about a year and a half ago. And so I'm constantly trying to push myself to do other things because it's important to me. So for me, I don't want to get to the end of my life or the end of my career where all I've done is work, work, work. And then money was the only thing I focused on and have missed out on my kids and my family and just doing fun things in life. So for me, I just kind of decided that I'm going to have to give up some money making in my practice and maybe work a little bit less so that I can enjoy these other things. And maybe when my kids go to college, you know, Maybe I'll step back up and do do a little bit more in the office or no, my wife and I will travel a little more. So I think you just have to decide what's important to you. And I decided what was important to me was not only treating patients and having a great practice that that, that treats people well, but really just enjoying my life and being healthy. That's really important to me. Yeah. Now, how many years ago did you kind of make this decision? Was that? Uh, you know, I think part of the reason I went into private practice was I always wanted to have control over my life. And I knew that if I worked for a hospital and I was an employed plastic surgeon, that I wouldn't have control over that. So I made that decision 14 years ago when I started private practice. So I graduated from plastic surgery training in 2009 and basically went to work with another surgeon who shortly retired like within a year after I joined him. So I made that decision way back then that I wanted to control what my life was going to look like. Yeah, you see, and I think that's great that you did that, and and I think it's quite rare because again, many of the doctors that I that I've met, it's like they just you don't you you're not taught this in medical school, you know, you're just taught to be a doctor, to be the best doctor you can be, and that means working around the clock, seeing patients, and and having no life, <laughs> um, and and even you know we get onto kind of like the business aspect. So for you to make that choice to go into private practice. 
comes with its own set of um, challenges too. In, oh, yeah. And you have to be a businessman, which again, that's not, I uh, was not taught in medical school. I do think many medical schools are beginning to incorporate kind of more things into their curriculum. But, you know, for those that are currently practicing today, is there's so many imbalances of responsibilities that make it more stressful. Yeah, running running a business running a practice is it's not it's it's also ha- it has its struggles. I mean, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. I I have my struggles and I have the things that I don't feel like I'm good at in business and so I have to go out and find the people that can fill the void of the things that I'm not great at to help me propel my business to the next level. And then even at this point 14 years out, you know, you and I briefly were talking about before we started the podcast about you know, this health and wellness idea I have and how do I, you know, I'm in the second half of my career in my life and I, there's other things that I want to do in my practice besides just be a surgeon. And I've got to find the people to help me, you know, the who that can help me get there um, is it's hard. It's hard running a practice sometimes. It really is. Now you mentioned, so, you know, we kind of started the show and one of the things that you had told me was, you know, you're the plastic surgeon who believes the last resort should be <laughs> surgery. And your work has has been a lot within breast and body work. And then we kind of got into exercise and nutrition. And so I, I'd love to hear more on in your practice with your patients who I'm assuming come in again for breast and body work. Many of them may have, you know, weight issues or, or other issues. And so how are you maneuvering your way into offering them a more holistic approach to their health and their surgery? You know, the first thing that starts with is that it's something I believe in, right? So I I walk the walk, I talk the talk. So I am in shape and I take care of myself. So when I see patients, probably about five or six years ago, it hit me. I was having patients come in to see me who wanted some body work. Let's just take tummy tuck for an example. And as I'm examining them, I'm like, they're not a good candidate. They're not going to get a good result. And it's not a skinny versus fat issue. It's a, here's why you're not going to get a good result. And why would you spend all this money to have a procedure that you're not going to get a good result? And what I think you need to do is, and I started educating about nutrition, and I think you have some weight to lose so that we can get a good result. And I found myself educating patients, but then kind of sending them out the door. And it was like, they would, I, I realized they were going to leave and probably never do what I recommended. And they were just going to go find a surgeon that would say yes and do the operation. Well, I realized that that wasn't serving the patient. And I came up with an idea to just start including services under my, under one roof and my practice that would provide them number one with mental health, right? Mental health is like, it's all the rage today because it's so important. It's very important to have good mental health. And I want my patients to be in the right mindset because if this isn't right, it doesn't matter what I do to their body, they're not going to be happy. Yeah. So that's one thing I offer in my practice is I have a mental health specialist at my beckoning call. When I identify patients that I think could benefit from talking to someone, she'll meet with them and have a conversation if they're amenable to that. The second thing is I have a nutritionist in my in my practice and the nutritionist, she's a macronutrient coach. Um, she's an RN and she has an adult and a pediatric license. And she helps my patients with the nutrition part. So a lot of times I'll have patients come in who say, I work out five days a week. I I eat well. I'm doing everything, but I just can't lose the weight. So I need the lipo or I need the tummy tuck. And when I identify that I know that there's more that they could be doing, but they're just misguided and they don't know what to do and they think they do, I'll have her meet with them and take them through a program to try to help them lose weight. And the yeah. reason I realized that this was so important is I didn't want a patient to just go find a surgeon, like I said, who would just do the procedure. I wanted them to say, me to be able to say to them like, hey, here's what I'm telling you that you need. And if you buy in, I got people for you. We have people here that can provide you those services. You don't have to look any further. And so by doing that for them, I'm setting them up that if by the end of their weight loss journey or getting healthy journey, they don't need surgery, great. That's awesome. Good for you. You don't need an operation. But if you do still have loose skin or something you don't like and we do operate on you, well, now you're set up to maintain your result and you're not going to fall off the wagon and gain a bunch of weight, like you have the tools that you need to be healthy. And that that's where this all came from. And that's something that I'm still currently building out of my practice. And I want to take it to the next level. But that's that's kind of where the whole idea was born for me. Well, you know, it's interesting that you you bring all of that up, which I think is is amazing that you're 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 now incorporating this. 
um, because I had, a, I had a friend many years ago and she had liposuction and, and she went to a plastic surgeon and a great surgeon, she had a great result. And I remember her saying to me like, oh my God, it, like I, I watched and you know, like I saw like 15 pounds of fat sucked out of my body. And she was like really verbal and, and like astonished at this result. Then two years later, the same person goes, you know, that liposuction never worked. And I'm like, what do you mean it never works? She goes, well, look at me. I put all the weight back on. And I said, you, you told me you saw 15 pounds of fat sucked out of your body. So yeah, worked, but you didn't, you know, and then exactly. it's like, and, and so if you can get patients to actually understand that they where they're going wrong, I guess, with their weight gain, if possible, which could also be mental health, you know, I mean, oh, yeah. it could be nutrition and you know, hormones. I mean, it can be all kinds of things that are contributing to this weight gain. Um, and if you can get them to a point where, you know, at least they can lose the majority of it, and maybe then there's still room for a small amount of liposuction or, like I said, tissue tightening or, you know, even a tummy tuck, you know. I mean, I, I think I think you just set them on, on like, their path for life. In, yeah, and I, in being yeah I agree. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, finish. I totally cut you off. Yeah, no, 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 don't worry. There's like so much. Yeah, I agree. Like they, you set them up for a success, like no matter what they do, you know, whether they end up having surgery or not, like you've set them up to be successful and to live in the body they want to live in. And I, I just think it's so important for us as plastic surgeons, as, as cosmetic surgeons and people who just do anything to alter the body that we we take this mindset that, Surgery shouldn't be the only thing we're thinking about. We're, we're doctors before we're surgeons. I love to say that, right? Like I'm a doctor before I'm a surgeon. Surgery is what I do, but I'm also a healthcare professional. And so I should be thinking of the person as a whole. And I think that is something that I would like to see everyone in my industry grab hold of because I feel like we've become, lots of surgeons have become, well, I don't want to lose the case. I know that if I turn them away, they're just going to go somewhere else and have the surgery. And we need to shift that from, hey, look, if they don't come to me after I tell them what they should do, I'm okay with that because I don't feel like they're following the course of action that I feel is best for them to have the best outcome. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's like you look at the fashion industry, right? And every, which is like completely different from what we're talking about. But <laughs> there's a brand like for everybody. You just, you know, we're not all Louis Vuitton. We're not all Gucci. We're not all, you know, what whatever you know, latest brand, at latest fashion has come out, but there is enough business for everybody to go around, and I think it's got to be the same in, in medicine. Not everybody is the right patient for you, and you are not the right doctor for every patient. And so, if you can narrow that down, and and then provide, as you say, that that the patients that you are cultivating will most likely go on to live a healthier life because of what you're incorporating from the get-go, you know, which I, I just think is, is huge and it helps humankind more than you probably could ever imagine. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Patient first, you know, like we had to put the patient before the pocketbook. And look, I mean, here's the other thing I thought to myself, well, I could send people out to a nutritionist and all these other people and they can make money providing those services or why don't I just make that part of my revenue stream and I'll provide the services and we'll just, we can still make money in our business of helping people with doing nutrition and all that rather than surgery at this time, you know? So that, that's where my mind went, my business mind, you asked about business, my business mind went to, well, I'm sending people out and other people are making money off of helping them get better, which is fine, but why not just provide that under my roof and make it part of my business? Yeah. 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 One-stop shop. I think it's great. Well, hopefully this will be something that you can you can expand on. Now, I, I do know that you have a book, correct? You, you I do. And, yes, ma'am. And can you remind me the title of the book? The yeah, it's called The Real Beauty Bible, and it's on it's on Amazon, it's on Kindle, I think it's on Audible as well. And and now in the book, because I, I, I did see a little blurb about the book that it said, you know, it's, it's, it's not all about plastic surgery. It is a plastic surgery book and how to achieve yeah. a great result. Well, so- um, can you share with with our viewers and listeners a little bit more what's in the book? Sure. Not? You know, I broke the book down into three categories. Part one was more centered around what procedures right for me, 
What are all the things I should be thinking about? Like how I talk to my family about wanting to have a procedure. Now that I've decided to have a procedure, I'm a young mom. I have a bunch of kids. How do I manage my thought process of doing something for myself and not being able to take care of my kids? The mental aspect of that. Um, I talk about in the part one, it's all about the preparing for surgery kind of information. How do I finance surgery? How do I afford it? So that's all part one. Part two is mostly breast and body procedures. And what I try to do in that section is just describe, here are all the different types of procedures that are most common that I do. Now, how do you know which one's right for you? Here's like a list of questions to ask yourself. And that's all of part two. Part three of the book is more about, I wanted to take people through the experience of what it was going to feel like the day of surgery. So I walk them through literally the morning of surgery. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to enter the surgery center. You're going to get an IV. 10 people are going to ask you the same question a hundred different times. And here's why we do that. And I walk people through just the exact day of what it's like to have surgery. And then I talk a little bit more about, you know, living in your new body. How do you maintain your new body? You know, what, what's, what's, what is from here? What happens after I've healed and I'm feeling great? What's next in my life? So the book, I really, the idea for my book was I wanted for anyone who is thinking about having a procedure, whether it's cosmetic or reconstructive. So I talk about breast cancer reconstruction in there. I wanted someone to be able to pick the book up and have a quick, easy read where they could go, oh my gosh, I know where to start. I know the questions to ask about the things that I think that I'm interested in. And I have a good feeling of what it's going to be like after surgery when I'm done. And so that's where the idea of the book came from. Mm. No, I love that. And you know, when you, you said earlier about, um, you know, if you kind of see a patient who you think could do with some, with some mental health counseling and you have a qualified professional on your team who can, you know, work with that patient, how many, um, what would you say is the percentage of patients that you send in that direction? So it started out that we made everyone go see her for at least a 10 or a 15 minute visit because I thought to myself, it'd be really cool if people were willing to sit with her for 10 minutes because maybe they'll open it up to her if there's something they don't want to tell me. So it started out that way. And then I quickly realized like, look, not everyone needs to go see the mental health specialist. Like if someone's coming in for a breast surgery and they have saggy breasts and they just want to be lifted and like, I get it. So then what it, what happened was as I'm talking to patients, I kind of get a sense for there's either been a traumatic event in their life or they have a food addiction or an issue with food that they've never dealt with. Um, I had one patient who had been sexually abused and never really talked about it. And she had yo-yoed with her weight her whole life. And we figured out, because I had her go see my mental health specialist, that she was keeping herself in a non-attractive place because she didn't want to be abused again. So once she dealt with that stuff, it was easier for her to then leap into making the transformations that she wanted to make. So I try to just have a keen sense when I'm talking to someone and I've gotten good at it where I can tell. And, and then occasionally, if I'm not sure, I'll say, hey, just so you know, like I have a mental health specialist in my office. Like if there's anything you ever want to talk to them about before surgery, like you're nervous, you're scared, anesthesia, whatever it is that I can just get them to talk to her, she can peel out of them all the other stuff. I just offer it. And some are like, yeah, I would love that. That's so cool that you have that. And some are like, oh, you know, I think I'm good. Like I have someone I talk to or I, I'm good to go. So that's how I try to position it so that I just, they know that that person's here and if they want to take advantage of it, they can. And I asked that question kind of right in the middle of you talking about your book, only because I think the book is actually an, an addendum to somewhat the mental health outreach because the, the book from this, you know, is something that they can really kind of come to terms with all the things they have to do from the preparation to the education, all the procedures and 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 then what's next, um, which I think is such a great tie-in with also having somebody who is really adept to understanding other things that are motivations for change. Absolutely. Yeah. It's huge. I mean, the mental health aspect is so huge. And I, people always ask me, they're like, do you you know, get the people who come in for like the crazy requests for plastic surgery and, and like just wish the public at large understood that all the stuff that you guys are seeing on social media and in the news of all these crazy botched operations and people with their lips that are so blown up and faces, 
we don't see those patients. Like they, they, those don't really, that's like the mainstream plastic surgeons and the stuff that we do. All of us are pretty ethical and we're not going to say yes to those kinds of people. Those people find the people that they know are willing to do whatever for a dollar and will put whatever in their face they want. You know what I'm saying? Like they know where to find those people. So we just don't see those kinds of people in our practice very often, thankfully. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, I mentioned like, you know, my background in PR marketing and in, in the past I'm working with big television shows and, and you know, there are, it's all about ratings in, in that type of media. And it's like, they just yeah. watching, which unfortunately becomes almost like a freak show. And, totally. you know, and then those people that they do find to be on the show with the promise of, we'll give you more plastic surgery, <laughs> you know. Exploit big, them. Big I don't know is just to create ratings for television. And there's not a, a lot of those types of people, fortunately, in the actual you know medical practices of, of doctors like you and, and most doctors in the country. Yeah, most of my colleagues and the people that I consort with when we talk about cases and things like that, they don't do that kind of crazy stuff. You know, we, we all have a pretty good ethical moral compass and and we just do things that we think are right for people. And, you know, there's always going to be people who are the outliers that kind of, you know, tarnish the field because of the things that end up in the media and things that happen. But the good news is for the public who's seeing this, most of the people that you're going to see have a good moral compass. Yeah. 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 I agree. I agree. Well, I make good. And so yeah. now in terms of um, other other offerings to patients. Is there any other things within the practice that we should talk about that are a little different that set you apart from from other plastic surgeons? You know, I think we we kind of hit it. I, I, you know, for me, one of the biggest parts about having a practice is making sure that my staff treats patients the way that I treat patients. So, you know, having trainings and and uh, and just making sure that everyone's on the same page with, with what the goals are. Um, and that is that the patient is first, right? We want to make sure that we're doing right by people. We're giving them good information, not misinformation, that they're feeling confident and comfortable when they leave here. They feel more educated than when they came in. You know, I'm never trying to sell surgery to a patient. I'm always trying to educate. So when I walk in the room, a lot of people are really nervous and I can identify that. And I, I tell them, I'm like, hey, take a deep breath. This is just, this is education day. I'm here to teach you about all the things that you think you might want to do you're not signing up to do anything unless you want to. We're not forcing any procedures on you. I just want to have a conversation and tell you what we can and can't do to help you try to achieve what you think you want. And then you go home and think about it and you figure out what's right for you. And if you have more questions, then we'll talk about that later. So I think that's the the attitude that more offices need to have. And, and I don't know a lot of offices. We're not very salesy here. We we just try to take people in and take the position of education. And we're just trying to give them the knowledge that they came for and then let them decide what they want to do. Yeah. Um, speaking of knowledge, and so one of the things I know is you have your Instagram page where you you have your practice Instagram page and then you have your other Instagram page, which I don't really quite know what to call it other than I find it completely fascinating because it's such a mix of, of medical mysteries, medical marvels, mm -hmm. history of medicine and and things that are, I find actually educational in, in a completely different way. And so what got you into kind of, is it just curiosity that you had to share with an audience? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Um, first of all, I love to educate. I love to teach. And because I'm, I'm board certified in general surgery, I did that first. I did a full residency training in that. And then I did plastic surgery. I have a lot of different medical knowledge that I feel I have perspective on and I can teach about. So my Instagram page, you know, all the social media platforms have become very much against any graphic content. You can't even show breasts covered up now. They start to suppress all that content. You know, and I was getting frustrated because I was trying to teach people about different things in plastic surgery. So on my Dr. Richard J. Brown page, the one you're talking about that became more of medical reactions and explanations and motivation and some of that stuff, I just decided this page is going to be nothing, pla like I'm not going to have much plastic surgery on this page. And whatever I do put on this page is going to be more about educating about fillers and, you know, just educating about procedures and what to stay away from. But it's mostly alarming reaction videos, things that I see that I go, Hey, I could explain that. Let's show a, a capturing hook clip from the video and then I'll educate people. And that's where that page kind of was born. 
I took all the graphic content off that page. So if people want to see my before and afters and they want to see more plastic surgery related stuff, I just put that on my brown plastic surgery Instagram. And even though it gets blurred out, it just lives there and people can see it there. And it doesn't affect my viewership because that's what happens. They start to suppress your page. And when you're a creator and you're putting all of this time and energy to create, let's be real. It's not all about the views and the likes, but you're trying to get in front of people to teach them something and to show them who you are which means you're trying to increase your following to bring them into the things you're trying to educate them about. And so since that one page was getting suppressed, I just took all the graphic content off and said, let me just become a medical educator and teach people about all kinds of crazy medical things that are happening in videos. Now people send me videos. I, in my DMs, doc, I need you to explain this one. Can you explain this one? What's going on here? So the content comes to me now, like I don't even really have to look for it so much. But that's really what my Instagram page has become. And then I have the plastic surgery page. Now, a lot of this stuff I cross post on TikTok and I and I put it on YouTube shorts. I'm about to change the game a little bit for me personally. I've been feeling like I really want to put up a little bit more long form educational content for people so I can share my knowledge and experience in my field with them. And so I'm going to start making long form YouTube videos. So that's coming. But everything I do is pretty much short form. But I, like you said, it's a smorgasbord of just anything medical that I feel like I can research or explain. If I think it's a cool video and it has value, then I just bring that to the people on my page, you know, and try to educate. Yeah. I mean, because some of them, I was like, where does he find this information? <laughs> but I, it's fascinating. It's, just it's insane. You know, but the plastic shirt, I'm able to bring a little bit of plastic surgery flair into that same page because I'll show some botched filler or some of the threads that people are using that I think is bizarre or has no scientific real, real, really anything good to bring to people. And I'll use those videos to go, Hey, I wouldn't have this procedure. I don't think it's worth it for this reason, you know, or this is a great procedure that I think you should try if you're this person. So I do still bring some plastic surgery into that one page, but I don't show any surgical content on that page because they just, they block it. Yeah. It's really bad. It's sad. Censorship. Welcome to the world. Well, I know it's because about you know cult, canceled culture or culture cancel or whatever. Yeah, I know it is, and it's just. But yeah. I'll tell you, if you want to know the real value of all of my social media for me, it's the following: um, because I like to answer questions and educate people. When people come to see me for a consult, they're like. I feel like I already know you yeah. because you just put yourself out there. I talk about my family. I show my kids sometimes. I'm less showing my kids today because of just the scariness that's on in the world now. But people that come to see me, they're like, I feel like I already know you. Like you're the same guy in person as you are on your social media. And I think that just makes people feel comfortable when they come to see me that they're getting the same guy that they're seeing out there on social media. So that's been the biggest value add for my practice is that I've built trust through social media with the people that see me, and that's the same person that I am when they come here. And I think as well is 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 you, I, as I said earlier, you know, we all kind of attract whatever it is to us, and so the people who see you at that that you build trust with, they also like you, you know. I mean, because they they like what they see, they like the personality, so it probably makes them feel a lot more comfortable coming to you because it's like they already know you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I have to do good work. You know, it's important to do good work, but you're, you're right. I mean, I, I'm turning 53 this week and you know, it's, it's interesting because you wouldn't think that someone in my age group would be so savvy or into all the social media and that, and I just, I love it. I've always been an electronically inclined guy and, and like with AI now, the way AI is growing so fast, I'm delving into that world to try to figure out how can I use AI in an honest fashion to create more information that's legit real information. And I mean, it's mind blowing what's going on right now, but I'm always an early adopter of that stuff when I find value in it. So it's been a lot of fun. That's great. That's great. And so tell me then, I, I would like in all of these kind of videos that you've found and you've seen in these medical stories, histories, botched things. Is there any one that stands out that was like even a surprise to you? Oh gosh. You know how many hundreds of videos I've made? I'll have to think about something that was the craziest. I, I can't offhand think of, but there have been some bizarre stuff. 
Like people do send me stuff that I have to, this is what I like. I have to go sit down and research certain things to make sure that it's legit or to make sure that I understand what's going on. But nothing stands out right now. I'm sure if you asked me off screen, I would think of something right away. But there is definitely some bizarre stuff. And I and I learned too. Like there are things from medical school that I remember touching on, but someone sends me a video and I'm like, oh, I got to go hit the books and like read about this. So it's fun for me to kind of rekindle old knowledge that I used to have and even get more in depth. Because now I'm in a position now where I've been in medicine long enough that I can just read something and I'm like, okay, got it. Totally understand how it works, understand the disease process. I get the lingo and I have it. And so I'm learning more about other fields just because videos are making me go do research. And that, that's been really fun too. Yeah. You know, being able to step outside of plastic surgery and learn other stuff. Yeah. Which I think is great. And, and again, that's, that's kind of, I, I find it to myself so fascinating because I've, you know, worked in medicine for so long and then seeing things that were, what methods from the past or why things were done in the past and and some things which are now returning as oh yeah as treatment um in modern day medicine you know like so, i'll tell you i'll think i'll tell you a crazy one i just posted this again and i've posted it several times before but you know cupping where people put the suction cups on to help i love cupping i mean i it, it feels great to me i enjoy it but you know bloodletting used to be a way that they tried to rid the body of disease we thought that it was helpful to do bloodletting and now they've brought that into cupping where they make little nicks in the skin and they put the suction cups on and they fill up with blood and it's like a form of modern day bloodletting now it's not legit we know that it doesn't really work for what it works but there's some religious undertone to that that's fine that's people's religion but there's also modern day diseases like hemochromatosis which is a collection of iron in the body and the only way to get it out is to basically lobotomy to to leach people's blood to get rid of it so there is some modern day realness that we're utilizing that was ancient times but you know those videos always blow me away the bloodletting videos that people send me it blows me away that that still has like a huge place now look we're westernized medicine i'm not gonna pretend that there aren't other ways in this world to treat patients that are outside of what my traditional t- learnings are. So I try to be open-minded to other things, but those are the videos that are very captivating and fun to read a little bit about, right? So I have to go back and read like, do we really use bloodletting anymore? Like, is that a thing? And I had to sit down and really read a lot about bloodletting. So it was pretty interesting. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. You know, I spend some of my time in Mexico and the medical system, at least that I've encountered here, is, is interesting. At least on, on, I mean, the plastic surgeons are very serious about plastic surgery. Yeah, good. Yeah. No, and that I that I have met. Um, but then there are kind of cultural shifts of things. When you mentioned earlier about patients, you know, and in your book, how what can you know, what do I do with my children while I'm having surgery? And so I'd been consulting with a plastic surgery practice in Guadalajara, and the question was, what do I, what do I do with the patient? When she comes in for a breast consultation and she brings all her family with her, including her children, <laughs> it's like it's oh, overwhelming. It's like the the grandma comes, the uncle calls. Yeah, 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 I know. Everybody comes and they all want to be in on the consultation, and so that was like, oh, okay, that's kind of interesting, you know. You know, I I set limits for that stuff. You have to. I mean, yeah. otherwise the office gets chaotic i usually tell them like you can bring your one in like bring your one who's your voice who's going to be your ears bring that person with you and then everyone else can hang out in the lobby and laugh and giggle and enjoy life yeah yeah and so that was kind of the advice because you know you need to and if any in the worst case you know at least after the children's books is something to yeah child happy in the lot you know in the reception area um but it is also there's a lot of holistic approaches to down here and and even you know what i've asked docs is about you know um like certain um kind of i wouldn't say it's required testing in the united states but you know suggested testing at certain ages and so i was asking a doctor about that he looked at me very very seriously and said do you feel unwell i said no no i feel great i'm just asking is that that particular procedure like a yeah you recommend a patient at a certain age go and have that test. And he said, no, no, we don't do that here in Mexico. So, you know, the, the, <laughs> there is a completely different approach. And, and I think 
as we progress more in the United States with our Western medicine and with some of the things that you were talking about, which would be considered more holistic. I mean, you know, not re not remedies, but the nutrition or the mental health or the, the other things that you help a patient before doing surgery is, is, yeah. is something that I, I think is much needed. Yeah, I think it's become too easy to request to do something and have a procedure and have it just available if you have the funds and the means to do something versus looking really internal and going, man, can I do something on my own to really help this process that might be really hard and difficult? Um, but how do I, how do I do that? And I think it's just become too easy to seek the, the, the quick fix that I call it the Amazon prime syndrome. You know, people want it yesterday. Oh, cool. Like I tried this diet and I didn't lose 15 pounds in four days. This doesn't work. And then they just dismiss the fact that nutrition and health takes months for you to see results. Like it doesn't happen overnight. You didn't wander into it. You're not going to wander out of it. So it, I think just it's become too easy and the, and the onus should be put back on some of us, I believe, to say, hey, let's hit the pause button. I know you're struggling and you really want this. Here's why it's not exactly the best time to do it. What can we do to help you make it more palatable to do the thing that you know you need to do? And I'll tell you, I have patients when I give them like the wellness conversation, they're like, I knew you were going to say that. Like they know before they come in that yeah. they've got weight to lose and that they're not ready, but they're just frustrated because they don't have the means to do it or the you know the know how to do it. So that's why I just want to provide that for them, and hopefully other doctors will do the same thing. Yeah, I think eventually we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. I hope so. Oh, so what's next for you then in in the realms of plastic? Surgery. Yeah. What is next for me is I'm actively trying to build out this entire wellness idea to make it something that I can potentially bring to people around the country to put their patients through in their own practices. So that's that's one big concept. And then uh, I would like to start doing the, you know, as they say, working on your business, not in your business. I'd like to start doing more maybe public speaking and educating and figuring out what my thing is going to be to, to help really the, the doctors of the future um, change their mindset, you know, from yeah. traditional medicine and what we're doing today. I think just educating. I, I really have this whole aspect of my business that I want to build out. Um, maybe I'll hire some some baby doctors, I call them, to start doing the surgical stuff. And maybe I'll cut back on surgery and start really building out some of this other educational stuff that I want to bring to the world, which mainly, honestly, it's the wellness stuff. I, I want to motivate people to take matters into their own hands and change their lives without expecting just a surgical procedure to get them there. You know, and just trying to really get the world to understand that there's a time and place for surgery. I believe in it or I wouldn't be doing it. And then there's a time and place to hit the pause button and maybe do some other things to get yourself where you need to be. Yeah. You know what I, I really love about this is because I, I really do believe in all the years I've been in, in the aesthetic industry and the surgeries and, and the patients, you know, surgeries I've seen, the patients I've met, the doctors I've, I've worked with is... I really do believe that plastic surgery is life changing and in a very positive way. And I think if you add on the wellness, holistic and, and future health of that patient, it can be even more life changing. You know, yeah. it's one thing changing an image, which we all know now does increase self esteem in most cases, you know, and it does increase relationships or business success or confidence, you know, but, but I think having that health aspect behind it can just only be triple the, yeah. the result. And you, I mean, you're hitting on a good topic. I think you and I get it because we've been in this business for a long time. And so we see the benefit of some of the surgical procedures that we do to help people. But I don't think the public at large feels that way. I, I get a lot of comments on social media, like, I would never do that to my body electively. That's so shallow. I wouldn't have this done. And I think people forget that there is a huge mental aspect to the way that we feel by the way that we look. Now, yes, there is the overboard surgery where we have to be like, nope, this like, I'm not doing this for you. This is unrealistic. This is not right for you. And then there's the place of, listen, your breasts are saggy. You can work out as hard as you want, and they are never going to be more lifted and round like you want them unless we take out some loose skin and reshape the breast. And then what that does for that woman 
in their mental mindset, like you said, where now they feel confident in their skin and that affects the relationship with their partner. It affects the relationships at work. It affects the productivity of their just everyday life in a positive way. And it helps elevate them to the next level. I don't see a problem with that. It's not shallow. It's just living your best you. And if that's what you needed to get there, so be it, you know? Yeah. Well, it's like you said, the majority of the plastic surgeons and colleagues of yours and the majority of plastic surgery patients are not doing the extreme procedures. And the procedures that they are doing are things because something that might be really small to you or to another person is huge to them. Totally. And having that that small change made has a massive impact on their life. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and then I, I do, I, I really believe if you can put the nutrition, you can put the fitness, you can put the health, the mental health, all of that with a procedure, that patient is only going to feel even 10 times better than they did have with that small change that they made. Yeah. And you nailed it earlier, right? Like, Every person is not cut out to be my patient and I'm not cut out to be every person's doctor. We have to pick, I, I learned a valuable lesson in my residency training and it was, you have to learn who not to operate on. Yeah. So when we identify the patients that we know either aren't doing it for the right reason or they're not listening to you and really understanding why you're telling them this isn't the right time to have a procedure, then you just have to respectfully part ways and say, hey, I'm not the surgeon for you. I don't wanna do something that I feel isn't right it's okay for us to part ways and for you to go seek someone else who might be a better fit for you. Yeah, yeah. You know, that is interesting that you bring that up because a, a doctor recently said to me, is is kind of the majority of physicians only listen for the first seven seconds of a consultation. Whereas he said, <clears throat> sounds like you listen for a lot longer. And Oh, yeah. Listen, but can identify a patient that wouldn't be a right fit, and um, which, which I think is brilliant. Yeah, it's it's really important and you're so right. I mean, I think you got to listen to the patient. My attitude when I'm seeing consults is this person is here for a reason. I'm not sure if it's surgery or something else, but we're going to get to the bottom of that as we have a conversation about what we're going to do. And it, it's really not that hard. I think if you do this for long enough, as you're talking to patients, it becomes very appendant, it becomes very aware what their agenda is. And it's easy to kind of judge whether they're on point with their thinking and they're doing it for them or if there's something else. And I, I feel like it becomes very clear once you've done this for a long time. I think as well, when you talk about your staff, and if we can just go there a little bit, because clearly you're sure. investing in your staff in, in staff outside of a typical practice to these other staff members. Um, but I, I, I am a firm believer in, in kind of in a business that kind of what I, what starts up here with leadership trickles on down. And so if you're training your staff to think like you, if when you have your vision for the practice, and I imagine that the staff can sometimes identify a problem patient before you even meet them. Absolutely. Okay. My medical assistant will sometimes say, uh, this one's going to be tough, you know, and she'll give me a couple things that she got from the history when she was talking to the patient. And it's good because it gives me a keen sense of, okay, when I walk through the door, I'm still giving this patient what I would give any other patient, but I got a few things in the back of my brain that I know I need to check off on my checklist to make sure that this is right, you know? So it, it is very helpful when the staff is in tune with what I believe in and you know, my staff knows that I, I would never pull the wool over any patient's eyes. I'm honest with everyone. I don't have a shred of dishonesty in my body. And so they know that I'm that kind of person, which makes it easier for them to be that kind of person. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, Dr. Brown, is there anything we haven't covered that you would, you'd like to share with our audience before we... I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, listen, I always want everyone to buy my book, The Real Beauty Bible. It's not something I make massive amounts of money on, but I think it's a great segue into sort of understanding the thought process through having plastic surgery or what it's all about. And then, of course, you know, people can follow me on, on Instagram and YouTube and TikTok and all the different places would be great. I'd be grateful. I love as many followers as I can get to spread my message would be beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for being on the Aesthetic Insider. It's been an honor to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Absolutely. 
And for those of you still with us, remember to watch next Wednesday for another exciting episode of The Aesthetic Insider.